We've been keeping up with the ongoing shocks to the American economy. The real estate bubble going pop, credit card debt, the bank mess far and wide. Now there is a new headache coming to a family near you, rising defaults on student loans. Many of today's grads owe more than $100,000. We're talking tens of millions of people in trouble. Alexandra Dean produced our report. The phone rings often in Gina Moss's little house in Baltimore. Oh, what do you do, poor Angus, when hunger makes you cry? It rings while she's getting daughter Alice ready for school. It rings when she's putting her to bed and a lot in between. For two years, I've been screening my calls. Um, any number that I don't recognize, I don't answer. Because why? Because it might be one of these people. Because it might be a bill collector, right? It might be one of the loan companies. Okay. Oh, you're such a big girl. The calls she's avoiding are from companies trying to collect on Moss's overdue student loan payments. They treat you like you're trying to be sneaky and be deceitful and like I'm hiding some Swiss bank account that I'm not giving them access to. And that's not the case at all. If I had the money, I would pay them. There just isn't any money. Moss currently owes about $1,000 a month in payments. That's more than a third of her gross salary as a social worker, so payments are always hard. But a few weeks ago, in the middle of this deepening recession, Moss lost her job. Now she finds the payments are impossible to make. It was very devastating initially. The first week was really, really hard. But Gina general, Moss isn't alone. She's now at the heart of a colossal controversy. In America today, there are 70 million people, about a quarter of the U.S. population, who owe a collective $700 billion in student loans. As more and more of these debtors have their hours scaled back or lose jobs, rates of default are on the rise. Experts say this could be the next financial bubble to burst. The Obama administration wants to do something about student loans, but the problem is much bigger than the initiative so far proposed by the White House. More on that later. During the time we spent with Gina Moss, it became clear that the burden of her student loans affects every moment of every day. As a busy single mom, finding time to unsnarl her finances is tough. Monday. Gina is a chaperone for her daughter's daycare field trip. Hi. Hi, bye. You look beautiful. Do you want pepper? Moss was herself yeah. raised by a single mom who got by on a small salary as a hairdresser. But she wanted something that her mother never had. I wanted a better life. I wanted more opportunities, more experiences. I wanted to meet interesting people and do interesting things and um, just have a chance. Did you have happy dreams, Alice? Yes. What did you dream about? Mommy and me as princesses, and we can turn ourselves into mummies. She thought college would be her ticket, but the price tag attached was too high. Then, a small private college in Ohio offered her a financial aid package tough to turn down. Gina only had to borrow $7,000 a year for tuition. We always buy the solution, right? That's correct. But throw in additional loans for books and supplies and living expenses, and by the time she graduated with her bachelor's and a master's in social work, Gina Moss owed a lot more than she had planned. I think I, the total that I actually borrowed was about $50,000, and then now it's a lot more with interest. Um, there's, there's about an extra $20,000 um, total for interest, and obviously it's just going up every day. Are you thinking you owe like 70 some odd grand? About 70000 yes. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. I mean, you don't want to get one of those professional degrees that would... Um, create higher paychecks when you got out, like going to the law or something? It never occurred to me to get an MBA or something of that nature because I just thought, you know, there are enough people doing that. We want to keep this nice and loose so it doesn't go around your neck. Moss's passion was teaching parenting skills as a social worker, and it's clear that she's a natural. 
If she had a few more years of experience, Gina could make a decent salary counseling parents. But in this awful economy, she says the job openings in her field seem to have disappeared. I have been working on my resume, working on my cover letter, being very creative. I've been applying for nanny jobs, um, which professionally is definitely a step backwards, but I'll take any job. Wednesday afternoon, Gina has an interview for work as a part-time CPR instructor. It's only a few hours a day, pretty far from what she needs, but it'll be something. Next week, she'll find out if the CPR job came through. Thursday morning, and she's going out to get food stamps for the first time. It just seems sort of bizarre, like I'm in the twilight zone. We don't own a TV, we don't go out to eat, you know, we don't do luxurious things. It seems a little bit strange that I still can't make enough money to take care of her. It's very sad. At the end of her second week out of work, I sat down with Moss to see if we could get a handle on all of her different loans. Urgent. Right. Student loan is 60 days past due, it says. Yeah, you don't want to get these. One challenge here is that a lot of young people sign on to these loans at 17 or 18 years old when few have much in the way of financial planning experience. Moss is no exception. She's been in a state of dread for some time about the bills she can't afford, and she's dealt with it by making scattershot payments. Now that she's lost her job, she hopes her lenders might grant her an unemployment deferment while she looks for work. But first, she has to understand her loans, original interest rate, what company gave her the loans, still a bit of a mystery, despite all this paper. Essentially, it's painful when you open it. It is. It's very painful. Um, and some of the papers don't have a lot of information. They just sort of say, pay me. I obviously get mail every day from these companies. And there are times when I don't even open them. I just... Um, it's just too hard. Right. I just, I just put the stack in there. And then when I'm really feeling ambitious or brave, then I'll open them all. Sorting through the pile, I was amazed to learn that Gina Moss has 17 student loans. Sounds bizarre, but there are reasons. Students can get out separate loans for tuition and living expenses every semester. Adding to the complexity, there are different flavors of student loans. There are private loans from private companies. There are government loans, where the government lends the money right to you. And there also is a hybrid kind government-backed money from a private company. You need to know which ones you have because each has its own set of rules and regulations. Good morning. I help you. We're interested in some financial aid. Gina Moss has all three, so she starts calling her lenders. Hi, Lucy. I was hoping that I could get some assistance in trying to navigate my student loans. Turns out half of her loans are direct from the government, and those direct loans are in trouble. It shows they, uh, they hold eight of your separate loans in default. So I have 14? That seems like a lot. She can't defer those loans, but there is some hope. Moss is told to look into a new government program. It's called income-based repayment, and it's tailored for low-income borrowers. At this point, I have nothing else to lose. My credit is ruined. But there is a big catch. First, Moss has to get these loans into good standing, and that means making payments right away. How much? Can you pay 90% of it within 90 days, which would be 42,000, dollars no, I'm sorry, I can't. That's an enormous sum of money. Do people actually say yes to you? It, it certainly is. Yes. Okay. I need 1% of her current balance, which would be $475 a month. That is also a huge amount. Sorry, $475 a month? $475 a month for 10 straight months is what it would take to get into good standing just on these government loans, and it is way out of Gina's reach right okay. now. 
I still don't actually know what's going on. <laughs> Next, Moss looks into her hybrid, federally guaranteed but private loans, known in the biz as FELP, F-F-E-L-P, for Federal Family Educational Loan. Uh, I actually lost my job two weeks ago. Now, they make up a quarter of her loans, and they're overdue, but still technically in what's called good standing, so she can apply to put them on unemployment hold. Sounds like good news, but wait. Here's why Gina's FELP loans are in decent shape. She says collectors from these particular loans talked her into paying them before paying her rent. I'm behind on my rent. I owe my landlord rent money and also late fees for being behind on the rent. You've been in the position where you've taken the rent money to pay off some of your student loan debt. Yes. That makes sense? No, it doesn't make sense, which is why I'm feeling so frustrated because I can't get sound financial advice. I can't, I can't find somebody to say, okay, this is what you do, this is the plan, this is how we're going to make it manageable. And is it really true that collectors for FELP loans are pressuring student debtors this way? After hearing from Gina and others about the high-pressure collection tactics of student loan companies, we decided to take a close look at one lender, the name that surfaced most frequently, Sally May. Now, you should know that while Gina has loans from lots of companies, none of her student debt is from Sally May. But Sally May makes more federally guaranteed student loans than any other lender. Sally May is the company many of us think of as the old government-sponsored lender. But in fact, it was reorganized as a private company in 1997, and then it purchased the name Sally May for $5 million. Most Sally May employees are bound by confidentiality agreements and don't talk to the media. But we found one man willing to break ranks. Mike Zahara, a former Sally Mae debt collector, was so angered by what he saw happen at his branch in 2005 that he decided to speak with us. I heard people say, well, why don't pay your rent this month? Why don't you pay your student loan instead? You heard debt collectors for Sally Mae tell people who owed money that they should pay the student loan first mm -hmm. instead of the rent? Instead of the rent, instead of the car payment. First things first, according to them. First and things first? Listen, we all owe what we owe, and we all have an obligation to pay things back. But clearly, if you don't pay your student loan, this is bad personal finance. If you don't pay your rent, you could be homeless. Well, exactly. And that was all because these kids who were making these calls were all had a bonus to chase. They didn't really care about the borrower. They cared about their end-of-the-month numbers is what they cared about. Zahara says he was not given enough time to help debtors understand their options. They wanted that collections effort done in two minutes. Uh, you were uh, audited by your supervisors, and if you were over a two-minute average over that month, you got either written up, yelled at, or terminated. And you're aware that there are some better options for some people who find themselves in a bind. Were you allowed to share all those good options with the people you were talking to? No, we were not. We were not allowed to, to discuss and inform them. We were there simply to collect. During the time Zahara worked at Sally May, the practice that troubled him the most was what happened when borrowers put their loans officially on hold, putting them into forbearance is the lingo. As he saw it, the borrowers didn't understand what they were getting into. So I could go on the phone and say, well, you can't pay your bill right now. Let me offer you some verbal forbearance. What that's going to do is bring your loan current, and it's going to take everything that you owe us and put it on the back of the loan. And we had a little spiel to read to them. Uh, but they didn't quite understand that they were paying interest on their interest by that. Zahara argues that Sally May had an incentive to let loans balloon that way because if the borrower couldn't pay back, the taxpayer would cover the bill. And since Sally May allows FELP loans to stay suspended for years, he says he's seen some loans almost double in size. Sally May never loses. They, they, they win if the borrower pays. They win if the borrower doesn't pay. They win if the borrower defaults. They win any possible way that you look at it. After Zahara complained to the government about some of the practices he says he saw at Sally May, he was fired. The termination letter stated Zahara had violated the company policy that we expect our employees to safeguard confidential information.
We requested an interview with Sally May, and the company responded with an email denying Mike Zahara's allegations. A faxed statement from Sally May said Zahara demonstrated a pattern of accusing others of wrongdoing regardless of merit, and the company said that forbearance is used as an option of last resort. Sally May is also in the midst of a legal battle with its own shareholders. For their lawsuit, the shareholders collected anonymous testimony from former Sally May employees alleging the company was too quick to put loans into forbearance. This time, the allegation is with their purely private loans. Sally May responded by filing for dismissal, and the case is still ongoing. And as for those hybrid loans or FELP loans made on behalf of the government by private companies, they have been at the center of a white-hot controversy on Capitol Hill. The Obama administration proposed ending them in favor of direct loans, where the government hands out the loan, cutting out the middleman. It's not a free market when we have a student loan system that's rigged to reward private lenders without any risk. The House passed that legislation in the fall. It included a grant package that is the single largest investment in student aid ever. The bill is now tied up in committee on the Senate side and set to hit the floor in early 2010. But whatever the Senate decides, private lenders will not be cut out of government lending entirely. Earlier this year, the government selected Sally May as one of the four private companies to service billions of dollars in new direct government loans, and private lenders, including Sally May, are still lobbying hard for an even bigger role in the direct loan process. Why? Industry sources admit that the government loan business gives lenders a strong presence on college campuses. And once there, it's easier for them to sell the third and most volatile kind of loan, private ones. They're lucrative, much less regulated, and interest rates, well, they can be surprisingly high. That's last year. How is it different? That's, that's what I can't figure out. Denise Slovaka's son, Jay, came to her in a panic when he realized his private loan was charging an interest rate of 18 percent. This is a private loan. This is no different than a credit card. It's 18 percent. I find it real hard to understand that it is a student loan. Denise says she always trusted Sally May. She saw it as the responsible government lender from back in the day, so she encouraged her son to trust it too. When I started school in the 70s, I had a Sally May loan, $2,500. And that loan at that time, by the time I got out of school, I paid $42 a month. But the whole idea was that loan was paid off within 10 years. In contrast, she says her son could spend the rest of his life paying off a total loan of $140,000, five times the amount he originally borrowed, and he's never missed a payment. College costs are going up, and with federal loans maxed out at around $10,000 a year, students are increasingly relying on private loans to fill the gap. And with these loans, rules, penalties, and interest rates can get pretty wild. To talk about predatory lending, these private lenders are, are the epitome of predatory. They're going after kids. Robert Applebaum is an advocate for student borrowers. He believes the Obama administration should create a way out for student borrowers drowning in bottomless debt. The only way to really unshackle yourself from your student loan debt is to pay them off, obviously, or to die. <laughs> it's nearly impossible to get rid of student loan debt, federal or private, in bankruptcy. There was a time when student loans had full bankruptcy protection, but Kevin Bruns, a representative of the student loan industry, says that privilege was abused. There was a point in time, and you may remember this, when the default rate on federal student loans was close to 20 percent. But be aware that while default rates were about that high in the 1970s, less than 1 percent of those borrowers actually went into bankruptcy. It's one thing if some sort of deadbeat is partying and not paying his or her student loans, but we are at a time of recession where People are losing jobs. They're right. Well, the bankruptcy rules do, do allow for dischargeability. Admittedly, it's difficult. And, you know, I have personal views on this that they probably should be made more lenient. I have definitely explored the option of bankruptcy, talked to a bankruptcy lawyer. Student loans 
don't count. Um, you cannot file bankruptcy on student loans. When you add all this up, what does this say to you about the system that we've set up to help people who have financial challenges get through college? It actually feels pretty discriminatory. Um, people who come from families with a lot of money, whose parents are well educated, who have good jobs, who have that privilege, have the luxury of going to college. And somebody like me, who doesn't have that privilege, is sort of out in the cold. And I did the best that I could with the limited information that I had, and now I'm stuck. Um, I can't give back the degree and say, take away the money and you can keep your degree. It doesn't work that way. Gina Moss is still fighting to get out from under her debt. She's just heard that she got the job teaching CPR, but it's a few days a week, so it's not big money. Meanwhile, her landlord has posted on her front door a notice of eviction. Gina and her daughter will have to leave. For now, a friend has volunteered a spare room, but it's not a permanent solution. Five-year-old Alice is pals with the family's young daughter. Well, we really want to be sisters. Yeah, well, we're not gonna be sisters. We're just gonna sit. Like, we're just gonna like see each other every day. Yeah. We're gonna be with each other. But then, but in a, in, but in one day you'll go and you're gonna home, in the other home, okay? Yeah. One day after that, I'm gonna go live in another home. We got a packet of telephone. Playing at house becomes playing at moving house. We got a new. And then the real moving day arrives. What about the other toys from your bins? And it's time for Gina Moss to face a hard reality. Her student loan debt has now, in a terribly literal sense, cost her the roof over her head. Oh my gosh, so how did you get tomatoes all the way up here? Sorry, Baba. I know, cutie. Is it time to stop yet? Almost. Any artwork that you want to get rid of, we can't keep it all. But I like it all too much. It's hard to be cute. I won't get rid of anything. <laughs> I just love it all too much. You know, I really thought I was going to have a better life than my parents and have so many more opportunities. Um, and I, I don't think that's true. We knew Gina's story was not unique. But when we asked you to send your own student loan stories to our website, the enormous response surprised us. Read about the struggles of dozens of other Americans whose dreams are buried under mountains of student loan debt. Find them through pbs.org. On the next edition of Now, movies and TV around the world are saturated with images of violence and horror. But is it possible to use pop culture in a different way? to promote peace and understanding across a country. I'm not naive. You don't watch one of our television shows and drop your submachine gun. But you can change the environment so it becomes more and more difficult to be in violent conflict. And that's it for now. From New York, I'm David Brancaccio. Happy holidays, and we'll see you next week. To order this episode of Now on DVD, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Now isn't only on your TV. Experience it where and when you want. Like on our website, where you can search to find shows that matter to you. Or download Now podcasts from iTunes to your portable player. Sign up for the Now newsletter for updates. And follow us on Twitter and Facebook for insider information. Choose the Now experience that works best for you. And don't worry, your TV won't be jealous. Funding for now is provided by the Orfala Family Foundation, the Park Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, the Marguerite Casey Foundation, 
the CS Fund, the Desjardins Blackman Fund, and by the following. And by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. Be more PBS.